The 911 call came in at 10.13 a.m. They had taken down the shooter by 10.27 a.m. That is jaw-dropping. Um, they got there astoundingly fast. It was amazing uh, how quickly they moved through the school and found her. They showed no hesitancy in that video. They very much put their lives on the line to go in there and protect those kids. Hey guys, you're listening to the Base Politics Podcast. I'm Hannah Cox here with Brad Palumbo. Today, we're talking about a Tennessee school shooting and America's mental health crisis. Republicans pass a parental bill of rights and a quick case roundup. Let's jump in. So, Brad, I've had another busy weekend. I had my sister in town again. That's a twofer for me, which for people who don't live by their families, probably you take that for granted. But I have not lived by my family since college. So I love having them in town. Her and her boyfriend came in to see John Mayer here. So we got to hang out, get some good food. It's been really fun. Um, and in the midst of all that, I'm sure you saw me post and celebrate, but we helped pass a universal school choice program in Florida this week. The governor actually signed it. So it will become law. I've heard rumors there might be some legal challenges, which apparently the Institute for Justice is more than ready to take on. So <laughs> we'll see how that all goes down. We're currently also about to see what's going to happen in Georgia with school choice. The governor just came out in favor of it. Yesterday, I think they're going to be voting Wednesday. So when this airs, we'll, we'll probably know by then. But lots of good stuff moving. Uh, and I'm heading to Richmond, Virginia next Monday and Tuesday to do a media training workshop with some friends at Americans for Prosperity. I'm looking forward to that. My grandparents lived in Richmond when I was a kid. And it's a beautiful, like very historic town. Did you ever go when you lived in D.C.? No, I don't think I ever did. Uh, no. it's I, I just have very fond memories of it as a child, but I haven't been there probably since I was in middle school. So I'm looking forward to doing that. What do you have on the agenda? Well, last night I played two soccer games in a row. So my entire body is uh, sore. Um, but we, we lost one, one, one. I scored a goal in each one. So that was fun. Um, but yeah, two games it put a lot of strain on my because I played with my team and then I guess played for another team uh, or that I'm friendly with. And so my whole body hurts today, but that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm just excited to be back at it. A lot going on this week. Unfortunately, some some pretty somber stuff taking over the news cycle, which is, uh, you know, always kind of um, just a, a little disheartening to see, you know, yeah. the knives come out and the same toxic discourse emerge. And um, but I'm trying to see the bright side, focus on some other stories as well, highlight good things that are happening, like school choice reform uh, and and some other issues that are making progress and just stay positive in, in real life and take Reggie for lots of long walks. It's finally starting to get warm here. So uh, I, I I can't complain. Well, I'm glad to hear it. But we do have to jump into some of these somber topics. And I think today we're going to start with the obvious, which was the fact that there was a, a shooting in Nashville yesterday at a private school. Can you walk us through what happened there? Yeah, so we're still waiting on the full facts and story from this tragedy to emerge. But what we know now, according to CNN, a police in Nashville are digging into the background and motivations of a former student who entered a Christian elementary school armed with AR-style weapons and detailed maps and opened fire, killing three children and three adults in the deadliest U.S. school shooting in nearly a year. The shooter, identified as 28-year-old Audrey Hale, was shot dead by police during the Monday morning attack leaving behind drawn-out maps of the Covenant School detailing how this was all going to take place, according to Metro Nashville Police Chief John Drake. And I will just take a second and say there's a, a very chilling video of the actual police uh, that, that went into the school and sh took down the shooter going around on social media. And I watched it, and I have to say, the police in this case are just absolute heroes. They go in, immediately they push forward ahead till they find the shooter and take the shooter down and it, i think it's about 15 minutes from 911 call to the shooter being taken down uh, and these police they are they're, they're just heroes and I, I i on one hand am so grateful and commending them but i also have a really hard time here because i think back to the uvalde texas shooting where you had police dallying around dozens of them waiting outside while people were being shot and killed and not going in for, I, I, I forget the exact details, but for a very long time. And I'm thinking about what lives could have been uh, saved if in other examples, the police acted this bravely. Yeah, I mean, I quote tweeted that video and said, perhaps Nashville police should get to train everybody else. 
Um, Nashville police are not with their, with other issues. I lived in Nashville for 13 years and we certainly had some problems, but this was amazing. This was heroic. I actually, in researching for this episode, saw that the 911 call came in at 1013 a.m. They had taken down the shooter by 1027 a.m. That is wow. jaw dropping. Um, they got there astoundingly fast. It was amazing uh, how quickly they moved through the school and found her. They showed no hesitancy in that video. They very much put their lives on the line to go in there and protect those kids. So they deserve all of the praise for their efficiency and, and heroism in, in that regard. And I think that obviously they were doing something right. The police chief came out and said, you know, we've been we've been worried about this. We've been prepping for this. We've taken this very seriously and, and all of our training paid off. So they're very fortunate that the police were able to get there as expediently as they were. But this is, of course, still not without its tragedy. Yeah. And we do have some more details also, again, from CNN uh, in a social media message apparently sent by the shooter minutes before the attack. The shooter stated a plan to die by suicide and wrote, something bad is about to happen. Other writings left behind revealed the attack at the Christian school was calculated and planned, police said. The shooter was someone that had multiple rounds of ammunition, prepared for confrontation with law enforcement, and prepared to do more harm than was actually done, uh, the police chief said. And police have referred to Hale as a female shooter and at an evening news conference, added that Hale was transgender, who used male pronouns on a social media profile, according to uh, what a spokesperson told CNN when asked to clarify the situation. So we don't actually know uh, everything about this and how it went down. And we, Hannah and I both feel there's a pretty major problem with media outlets and pundits rushing to politicize these tragedies and pumping out hot takes. And so we're really, beyond what we've told you and beyond wishing the victims all the best, not going to get into the nitty gritty of this tragedy. Uh, we're just going to wait and see. We commend, commend the Nashville Police Department uh, and our, our thoughts and prayers are with the community that's suffering from this. But I, I, we don't want to turn it into a political partisan football like so many people are doing. So we, we're going to zoom out a little bit and talk about the bigger picture issues here. One of which uh, I think just certainly has to be mental health. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think on top of everything, we have covered mass shootings in the past. I think our audience knows where we stand on gun rights. They know where we stand on how to improve school safety. They know where we stand on policing reforms that need to take that need to take place in many of these cases. But we have what we can talk about right now, I think, are the underlying causes of violence. And I want to clarify again, we don't know all the details in this case. We don't know what this person's mental health st status was, but what we can say is that there is a trend um, in these incidents where people like this do have mental health. And as somebody who's worked pretty extensively both in mental health care and on mental health policy, I think it's time that we start having a much more serious, concrete discussion. And I don't mean like throwing around like something needs to be done about mental health. You often hear people say that. Yes, but we've got to get into the nitty gritty of what. Um, and I want us to unpack that today because if I'm going to be honest, this is probably the issue I struggle with my libertarian principles the most in. I feel like it's very murky. I have a hard time determining where the line is between protecting civil liberties and between protecting society and individuals from people who have a tendency at times to become violent. And so we're going to unpack that today and it's going to be complicated. And I want to be clear, like this is an emotional topic. We recognize this. This is especially emotional for me. Of my 13 years I lived in Nashville, two of them were in Green Hills, literally a street behind this church. Um, yesterday when the shooting first happened, I have two of my best friends who have kids at a church um, school that is across the street from this church. And I couldn't tell which church it was at first. So I was trying to find pictures. And I very much thought two of my friend's kids might be dead for a little bit yesterday. So I'm very emotional about it. Um, and I'm somebody who has been drastically impacted in my life by mental health on a number of fronts. So I, I kind of just want to say all of that to be very transparent, um, that I'm not unbiased in this. I'm not without emotion in this. And just like everybody else, I struggle to process those realities and those feelings and those sort of additional layers while also trying to figure out what my principles say, what is ethical here. And that's something that's not always easy to do. And I think sometimes people are very um, quick to sort of be black and white on these kinds of things or act like they're cut and dry. They're not. Um, Green Hills, for those who don't know, is one of the richest per capita in the U.S. This is a place that people spend a lot of money to live. These are the kind of schools people spend a lot of money to go to to ensure that their kids are safe, to ensure they have a good education. These were private Christian schools. Um, I don't know what their status was on being anti-gun or gun-free zones or not, um, but 
we know that there wasn't like the government layer of mandating that they were gun free zones. And so that just shows you how complicated these matters are, because even in this kind of area, even with those kinds of parameters, even getting outside the public school system, these kinds of things can still happen. And so because of that, I do think it is vastly important that we move past the conversation around guns and start digging into what actually causes a person to become violent. How do we identify a person who is escalating and about to become violent? What are the kinds of interventions that are needed? And how do we balance those things with upholding people's civil liberties? So Brad, just kind of your overall gut reaction to that before we dig into more of the meat here. Yeah, I think there has to be something here because um, everyone wants to make this debate about guns. And obviously, guns are a very relevant factor here. We can debate all the policies uh, separately. But 20, 30, 40 years ago, America had tons of guns. America did not have strict gun control than it did than it does now. Yet we didn't have the same degree of these high profile mass killings. Um It's just clear that something else has changed, even all else staying equal with the gun question. So the idea that guns are only the issue here doesn't make any sense because, for example, this shooter killed uh, uh, six people. Well, a a mentally unstable person who wanted to kill six people could easily do that with a vehicle, with a knife, with a handgun, which no one is seriously talking about banning. A pistol could just as easily accomplish that as an AR-15. Um, so it's not just the guns, even if you do believe in gun control. I mean, we could hash that out, debate all the specific policies, but it's clearly something more than that. There's clearly something going wrong where a small minority of mentally unwell people are becoming violent and lashing out at society and they're falling through the cracks and people aren't picking up on the warning signs. And I want to be clear that it's not as if this applies to all people with mental illness. You know, uh, the vast, 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 vast majority of people with mental illness are not violent. Mm -hmm. In fact, people with mental illness on a whole are 10 times more likely to be a victim of a crime than an offender. Uh, And I personally have struggled with anxiety disorder, taking medication for it. Um, I so you could say I'm somebody who's experienced mental illness. I certainly have never been violent towards anyone in my life. And so we want to be preface the fact that it's really unfortunate to kind of stigmatize these events and cast a broad blanket and a a broad brush onto all mentally ill people or people with mental illness. You'll see these takes. Um, But that's really not it. It's this small subsection of people who are clearly mentally unbalanced in a specific type of way and become a public threat and hazard. And there's red flags all over the place. And yet somehow they're allowed to go on. And that's the group of people we need to hone in on and figure out what to do about. Not all people with mental illness, but a specific subset of that much broader category that keeps appearing in these types of situations across demographics, across different communities, different parts of the country, different types of weapons, different types of shootings, different targets. The common thread here is people who are deeply mentally unwell because a mentally well stable person doesn't go out and kill random strangers. This simply Mm -hmm. doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that you point out this could just as easily happen with a knife. Many of the incidents that we do see occurring within violence within this population are not carried out with a gun. I mean, and just for scalability, six people were killed in this incident. Brian Koberger broke into people's house allegedly in the middle of the night and killed four people in under 20 minutes as well with with a knife. So like, and the guns, the weapons are not the problem. We have to treat the underlying symptoms. And I'm going to be really honest about some things I've dealt with in my life that I don't talk about publicly that often because while I am a very open person as a public person, I feel like I have to balance the privacy of people around me and others that might be impacted by me talking too openly. So I'm not going to name names, but I will say um, I've always been very interested in mental health issues. For a period of my life, I thought I was going to pursue being a psychologist and go into working in mental health. Um, I first one of my first jobs in politics was working as a as a pro bono advocate at the National Alliance for Mental Illness as a, as a lobbyist for them. I've, I've been very passionate about finding libertarian solutions to these problems for some time because I don't believe that big government can be the answer. But I have been very impacted by this. I myself have an anxiety disorder. 
Um, I have chosen to not medicate for that. It's more of a rank and file type disorder. I'm not at all opposed to people who choose to medicate. In fact, I, I really encourage it and have some pretty strong stances on it when it comes to people with severe mental illness not taking their medications. But I think that you have to be proactive. I work really hard to do counseling and to stay physically fit and to eat healthy and to not use drugs or alcohol to uh, you know extreme levels so that I can manage those things. And I think it is your personal responsibility. And I've been very fortunate that I've had the resources and just the intelligence and commitment to make sure that I handle my business. But there are other people in my family who have not done those things. Uh, we have one family member that we have repeatedly dealt with for 15 years now um, who is severely mentally ill, will not stay on their medications, consistently makes threats against other people himself. And there is quite simply nothing we can do about it. He's over 18. Uh, he refuses to cooperate. We can't really get him in beds. Even when it becomes state mandated, he'll often get kicked out. And like, it is an ongoing problem in my family where I very much had to distance from that relative. And that's really all you can do when you're in these situations, um, in my experience, is distance. Because if they're not willing to take their own mental health care seriously and, and take it in, under control, they will continue to be a problem that bleeds all over the family and the community for years and years to come. And it drains people of their finances. It often does lead to people being harmed or killed. It is emotionally and mentally draining. Uh, I've also dealt with a situation that I don't speak about publicly in my relationship with a family member in that person's um, circle that we've had to deal with that has at times involved police. Uh, my father is a pastor. He is currently having to deal with a very unwell individual who keeps showing up at the church's campus and who is a threat and who has a restraining order and who does not care. And the police will come and remove them and then let them go and they show up again. We, I feel like I live under almost constant threat from these people. So I do feel very emotional about this. And I'm very fed up with the way the system operates, where essentially you were told that there is nothing you can do until it's too late, until they actually carry out with it and do hurt people. And so while you are absolutely correct that people with mental illness as a whole are not the problem, it really is that they are 10 times more likely to be a victim than a perpetrator. Um, it's also true that about three to five percent of violent offenses are carried out by people with mental illness. And so it is a small percentage of the mental health population that is wreaking havoc on society and on their families and on their friends and in their communities. And literally nothing is being done. And as somebody who sort of looks at things through the nap, which I think is a little cheesy, but like I think it's a, it's a good line to evaluate, which would be the non-aggression principle. And that would basically say that, you know, government shouldn't be involved and there shouldn't be laws unless somebody is aggressing against someone else, their person or their property. And when it comes to these mental health issues, um, you know, it, it feels like they are aggressing on people before a law has actually been broken sometimes. Like they are they are wreaking havoc. They are threatening violence. And still the line is nothing gets done until they actually are violent. And by then it's too late. And so I just want to be very open and honest that like I really do struggle because I am very committed to upholding civil liberties. And again, I have very serious concerns about the government um, allocating any of this. But I do think that wherever this line is, and I, I hope that you and I can maybe identify it a little bit better today, we are currently not at it. We are missing the mark. Yeah. And I, this is where uh, the question of forced commitment comes in, right? Of what should the stand, because you can, if you right now there is a path to get somebody committed to a mental hospital against their will, if you can prove that they're a threat to themselves or others, but in many cases, it's actually quite difficult to do, and they end up only they, there's only a short period of time. They can be mandatorily held, and I think it, that that this system has kind of emerged as an overcorrection to a uh, historical error in the opposite direction, where for <laughs> a long time uh, people were put in institutions, and basically the key was thrown away. They would just send off the mentally unwell family member to an institution for the rest of their life, um, and so there were really severe violations of civil liberties uh, that, that occurred. But now we don't even have institutions really for for in terms of um, mental illness. I believe the last one closed in 2015. So just to fill in the holes a little bit here, um, basically starting under JFK, there was a movement away from institutionalization. And he signed a law, I think it was actually his last law that he signed before he was murdered, um, that would basically start transitioning institutions from being government run to community run. And this has been a big push on the left for some time. You continue to see that same kind of push right now with policing, where they want more community run operations. 
I get it. I'm inclined to support it because I'm like, anything's better than government running it. But they often don't end up actually being able to raise the funds or getting the real structure and organization that they need to adequately operate outside of government. And that's sort of what happened in the 1960s. So once he signed that law, the institutions kind of started draining. And then when Ronald Reagan was governor in the 1980s in California, he basically um, shut them down. And then they started emptying even faster. So after Ronald Reagan signed that law, they basically began to lose more and more population. And by 2015, there were essentially no more institutions in this country. Um, and I think what happened is that you saw those populations matriculate into other systems. So while I, so I have to push back on the numbers here a little bit. And I, I want to say, like, I think it's really important that we do destigmatize mental health. And it's it's we don't want to ever do things that would make people less inclined to get treatment or less inclined to talk about their mental illnesses or to hide them. But when they say only three to five percent of violent incidents are related to mental health conditions, I struggle to believe that because the data inside our jails and prisons tells a very different picture. Today, nearly half the people in U.S. jails and more than a third of those in U.S. prisons have been diagnosed with mental illness compared to about a fifth of the general population. Uh, and I have some data here in the notes that say the percent of people in state prisons who have been diagnosed with mental disorder is 43 percent and locally run jails. It's 44 percent. The and number probably people, more undiagnosed. Yes. The number of people experiencing serious psychological distress in jails is one in four. Um, and so I, I just struggled to compute this notion that that, that there's not that many crimes being carried out by people with mental illness. And on top of that, like you said, many people don't report. Um, many people with mental illness have what's called anosognosia, which is actually a component of the mental illness itself that sort of prevents people from being self-aware of their own illness. And that's why you'll often see people who are schizophrenic as heck try to represent themselves in trials or things of that nature because they truly do not believe that they are ill. And that is it's it, it catch 22 because it is a component of the disease. And that is one reason a lot of these people don't want to take their meds or they'll go through highs and lows and believe they're good or they'll try to deny it. So anyways, when they say these numbers, I just I, I understand why they're pushing them. I understand where they're coming from, but I, I find it impossible for them to be totally accurate. And again, like, I don't think that the numbers really bear out when we look at the criminal justice system. And to be very clear, the criminal justice system is not equipped to deal with these issues. According to a Washington Post database, Nearly one quarter of fatal police shootings involve a person with mental illness. And once inside a jail or prison, the mental health care a person receives generally ranges from an adequate to abusive. Suicide rates are disturbingly high. Um, and so as a whole, there's like this mental health crisis that got pushed out of institutions and onto our streets and into our jails. I think you could also look at the rise in the homelessness population, which has skyrocketed in recent decades. I saw in 2018, L.A. had a 75% increase in six years alone. This is overtaking our urban centers. And so... This is a huge problem. And I, again, finding this balance of not stigmatizing mental illness, but let's have a real talk about what's really going on, because I do think the numbers show that there's a much bigger problem than they want to indicate. Um, and when they shut down institutions, to be clear, um, that also shut down a lot of the beds. And due to how overregulated our healthcare system is, due to things like certificate of need that actually prevent new beds from being added, um, we have a huge shortage. So the U.S. has only 21 psychiatric, psychiatric beds per 100,000 people. That's really, really wow. low. Um, yeah. So even when you do have somebody who is compliant and willing to get help and willing to seek treatment, you still often have a huge wait list to get them into a bed. And on top of that, it can be very, very expensive because most of these are private facilities. I mean, it can cost $30,000 a month. And so unless you have very good insurance or you're on like government insurance, it can be very difficult to get a place there. And so I think that the question we have to ask is that in shutting down institutions, you know, what was the line? Like, I think the civil liberty abuses were concrete and I and I still really am fearful of those and struggle. But to say that this in any way created a better situation, I don't think you can say that. Yeah. I mean, at, at the same period, time period you're describing of closing them all by 2015, but really starting in the, the 70s and 80s, is also kind of coincides with the era of the mass shooting. Not saying uh -huh. that's causal, that proves the causality or that it's all the, all that's going on, but the timeline there does seem to overlap quite a bit. And I also think it's undeniable the fact, the extent to which mental illness is wrapped up, uh, an untreated mental illness is wrapped up with things like homelessness. Uh, because it's not the case that we have homeless crisis just because housing is too unaffordable. Um, it, it's because m 
a large percentage, if not the majority, I'm not sure, but a large percentage of people who are homeless are uh, mentally ill in some form or another. They can't hold a job. They can't work. Uh, it's not that they can't live somewhere. They can't even go. To, they won't can't or won't even go to a shelter that exists so often many of the times. So um, it, it's just hard because it raises the question what to do with people who don't want help, who uh -huh. won't take their meds who don't uh -huh. want to be admitted to a mental hospital. And it's hard because on one hand, you have their civil liberty concerns, and it's pretty disturbing to think of the history of like forced sterilization, forced lobotomies, so many things that people were subjected to. Um, but on the other hand, it's kind of the point you raised about how much are you allowed to bleed all over pe other people before it becomes enough of an infringement on others that uh, exterior third party action is justified. And I think in a lot of these cases, uh, that line is is being met, but then not the, then we're not actually acting on it. I mean, how many times do you hear about a mass shooting where the person was known for years, this was a dangerous mm -hmm. person, people reported them to the police, there was nothing the police could or would do. Uh, yeah. The community knew, the family knew. It's like we, it feels like we always end up hearing that in many of these cases. And yet nothing is done to contain these, these dangerous people out of fear of, you know, violating people's civil liberties. And I'm not exactly sure what the solution to that is. Um, but I think there's got to be some discussion about what you can do to forcibly commit somebody if they're dangerous to others. And right now that's just, incredibly difficult to do in many circumstances. Yeah, it's a very hard line for me because, you know, I was very opposed, for example, to vaccine mandates. I don't think people should be forced by the government to put things in their body. I think that is an ethical violation. That being said, we do have studies that show when people with severe mental illness, SMI, take their antipsychotic medicines, they um, drastically decrease the likelihood of becoming violent so long as they weren't violent beforehand. Like if they were already showing violent tendencies as a child, and then they develop schizophrenia in their 20s. It doesn't really make a much of a difference. So I think those people might just be like more inherently violent as people. But if they were not violent and they the, clearly the violence became a part of their mental illness and they take their meds correctly, it drastically decreases. And so, yeah, I struggle with this. Like I am increasingly almost leaning towards being in favor of bringing back institutions. Now, I'd want to do it drastically different than how it was done. I think you'd need much more independent oversight. I think you'd need a lot more involvement than just the family, like friends, colleagues, police that have been involved in the past. But as someone who's in one of these families that, that worries about this happening, when they say, where were the families? It's like the families were trying to get help for years, for years. We've been begging for help. We've been asking for help. I would love for this relative to just be locked up at this point, to be honest, because I think he would no longer be a danger to himself and others. Like it's to that level where, um, the people who are, are begging for help, like they have no recourse. And I cannot explain how absolutely frustrating that is and how terrible it must be when that finally accumulates and something really bad happening. So I I think that I am, you know, as hard as that of a line as that is for me to take as a libertarian, I think that the uh, threat that those types of people pose, and you can see it, right? If you're studying these people, if you study their cases, you can typically see them escalating. You can see the threats going on. Even this individual who carried out the shooting in Nashville had recently reached out to somebody, a former like uh, um, teammate, I think, from some sports she played and said that she something that was going to happen and she was going to commit suicide. And there was really nothing for that person to do other than call the suicide hotline. By the time she got any help, the shooting had already taken place. And so it, it really is a, a thing where you can, usually if you're around these people, we can start to point to these factors and there should be some kind of intervention that can take place and make it a high burden, I guess. But it something has to be able to be done. It, it can The line cannot be that we wait until they're violent or we even allow them to be violent in ways where people don't get killed and we continue just turning them back on the street, right? They're assaulting people. They are breaking into houses and, and taking guns. There's there's these signs that they're going to become more violent over time that I think need to be able to be identified and then there has to be recourse for people when that happens. So that's uh, where I'm at and, I, and I'm being very honest. Like I know I'm gonna get criticism for this because I'm sure there's hardline libertarians who are like, no, never. And I'm just not there after having dealt with this. And I and I think that, again, getting these people to consistently take their medicines, like I wish if I had a dream society, I would be like, you know, if you don't want to take these medicines and you don't want to put them in your body, that's fine. Go live on an island with other people like that. <laughs> like, well, just get away from society. And that way you don't hurt us because I, you know, that's your prerogative not want to take a medicine. I get it. 
But when you're going to live in society and the repercussions of you not taking that medicine or that you might harm all of us and at the very least, like emotionally and mentally harm everybody in your life, which is often what these people do, it really is a violation of the NAP. And I don't know how else to to deal with that. All right. Well, that is uh, our thoughts on this matter. It's obviously a really hard subject to tackle. Again, our thoughts are with the, the community in Nashville right now that's suffering. Uh, let us know what you think. If you're on YouTube, you can comment below and we will uh, read your comments. If you're listening to us on audio, you can always shoot us an email or a DM on social media. Uh, but we'll leave it there for now on that one. And we're going to talk about something else that's pretty interesting, which is the the Republicans in the House of Representatives just passed a so-called Parents Bill of Rights, federal legislation that enshrines a number of transparency and accountability measures into education nationwide. But some Republicans defected and voted against this. And we're going to talk about that intra debate because it's very interesting. Uh, but first, here's what's in the bill from The Hill. Um, five House Republicans broke from the GOP and voted against the Parents' Bill of Rights on Friday, an education focused measure the conference brought up to emphasize parental rights in the classroom. The House approved the measure in a 213 to 208 vote with all voting Democrats opposing the legislation. Five Republicans joined them in opposition. Representatives Andy Biggs, Ken Buck, Matt Gates, Mike Lawler, and Matt Rosendale. The legislation would, among other tenants, mandate that schools post their curricula publicly, require that parents are allowed to meet with their children's teachers, and demand that schools provide parents with additional information when violence happens on school grounds. Additionally, it would require that parents receive a list of the books and reading materials accessible at the school library, and it would allow parents to have a say when schools are creating or updating policies and procedures related to student privacy. Hannah, here is uh, Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy on this legislation. You have a parent's bill of rights now. This says the parent can now know what's being taught in the school. This is now saying the parents can now look at the reading material. It's now saying the parents can now see what the money is being spent on us. It's now saying that the parents can protect their kids' privacy. It now says the parents can have a notification if there's any violent activity on campus. But unfortunately, the Democrats are too extreme to believe that parents should have a say in their kids' education. All right, Hannah, what do you think of uh, what's in this legislation on its merits? So on its merits, it all looks pretty kosher to me. It seems like common sense things that I'd want if I were a parent, had a kid in the classroom. And it's kind of weird that we need policy to determine these kinds of things, to be honest. Like you would think this was just basic kind of communication going on between schools Why and parents. Why are schools doing this now? <laughs> <laughs> like what is going on? But par for the course in these institutions. Yeah, I, I agree with you. All of these things sound very reasonable to me. I'm all about transparency in education. You know, I, I don't want parents to be completely controlling everything a teacher can say or do, but they should at least have every right to know what's going on and then voice their say with the school board and also with school choice. Pair, the, pair transparency with school choice and then, you know, let the chips fall where they may. But, it, of course, like any good policy debate in the House, uh, you have to have a few pretty unhinged takes out there. So our, our favorite, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, actually called the uh, GOP's bill for a parent's bill of rights fascist. Take a listen to her remarks from the House floor. They are asking the Republican Party to keep culture wars out of classrooms. Our children need urgent and aggressive educational solutions. The American Library Association coming out against this Republican proposal. When we talk about progressive values, I can say what my progressive value is, and that is freedom over fascism. Thank General you very much. Time is so Hannah, AOC having a completely normal one, as usual. Why does she always think she's like a black pastor when she's on the floor? She's up there just like preaching, like hitting the book. And I'm like, are you, this is so staged for social media. Like you want that clip so bad, girl, go perform like the little circus person you are. Like I can't handle her at all. And I think it's really disingenuous. I'm so tired of them calling everything fascism. Like. Fascism has an actual definition, and it's a pretty sturdy one and needed one at that because it is a real threat. But it's sort of like how they call everything racist. Now they call everything fascist, and they're the boy that cries wolf because when you really do have a fascist person come in, 
that nobody's going to believe you or listen to you. Like, I remember when Trump first hit the scene, I said to my mom, I'm like, I think he has fascist tendencies. I still think that. But people didn't take it seriously because they call everything Hitler, everything fascist on the left. And so you, nobody really knows what the word means anymore. It's just sort of this, like, catch-all. She's literally, she's literally talking about legislation that says schools have to post what books are in their libraries publicly yeah. so parents can look. And she's calling that fascist. The also, Nazis in saying, Germany were fascist. Also, she is quite literally saying that the Republicans should keep culture wars out of the classroom when it is the left that is trying to push all of their LGBTQ ideology and theory into the classroom. So, no, if you don't want the culture war in the classroom, save that for your homes. If you want to teach your kids about all these gender issues, go for it. But it doesn't need to be in the classroom and every parent should have the ability to determine that. That's that's you guys pushing the culture war. And I so agree with your point. It's like what they did with racism. They called everything and everybody they didn't like racist for so long that when actual racism is still c crops up, you know, and they no one believes them when they warn them. And now actual racism in some pockets is, is uh, not recognized for what it is because they've overused the term. They're doing the same thing with fascists. And it is incredibly cringe and incredibly counterproductive. Mm hmm. But. When I saw that five Republicans voted against this, it did pique my interest because I wasn't really following this bill, hadn't read it very carefully. And the names of who opposed it were especially interesting because several of these people are pretty hardline social conservative MAGA types like Matt Gates, Andy Briggs. So I wanted to dig into what their reasoning was. And like I say, I was pretty swayed by some of it. Now, Four of them I'll get into in a minute. One of them voted for it for you or voted against it for a unique reason. He'd actually been um, a sponsor on the bill, Lawler. He's a freshman and he has a district that President Biden won by 10 points in 2020. So I think that's relative to know he's um, definitely going to be bucking his district when it comes to this kind of legislation. But he said he voted against the bill despite being a co-sponsor because an amendment added to the legislation went too far. A spokesperson for the congressman said he was referring to the amendment introduced by Representative Lauren Boebert. Um, and that said that parents have a right to know if their child's school allows a transgender girl or woman to use a bathroom or changing room that does not correspond with the sex assigned at birth. And that addition passed the House by a voice vote. So he said, unfortunately, a late amendment to the bill that unnecessarily targeted certain children went too far. Our goal as parents, educators and legislators should be making lives better and safer for our children. And I'm concerned that this amendment could do the opposite, putting vulnerable children at greater risk. So that was an unusual reason for a Republican to vote against it. What are your thoughts on that? Well, he must be a, a moderate or kind of a squish because he's in that yeah. blue district, like you said. And so here he's trying to not anger his his home voters. So whatever, politically, maybe that makes sense. But on the policy merits, I don't look, I'm no fan of Lauren Boebert, but that sounds reasonable to me that parents should know. It is hard. I don't have, you know, a black and white position on how to handle transgender identifying kids in schools um, because either way, you're kind of creating a problem. If you force a transgender girl to go in the boys' locker room, there are some problems there potentially, but also there's some problems if they use the girls' locker room. At the very least, I don't think it's unreasonable that parents should know if their young daughter might be in the same locker room as somebody with male genitalia. Like That doesn't strike me as particularly fascist to inform yeah. the parent. Uh, now, he didn't say it was fascist, but you he, uh, you get my point. It doesn't seem crazy, but I get that's probably just him balancing his moderate district's politics. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's a really complicated issue. I hate when people try to minimize that because you're right. Like, I understand my parents would want to know if a person of the other gender was in their child's locker room that was assigned at birth, like, and that obviously hasn't had a surgery yet. So I, I understand that. I also understand that if you are to send that information to parents, you're going to have people with pitchforks targeting a vulnerable child who's already just trying to fit in, trying to be normal, and they're going to become targeted and, and made to be some kind of like creep or like weird person. And, and I just think that'd be a terrible thing to bring down on a transgender child's head, too. So this is a murky, complicated issue. I think probably the best solution is gender neutral locker rooms being available for people who need them or changing mm -hmm. rooms or for those who need them. That seems like the easiest way to solve this that upholds everybody's rights. But um, so I think so one side note, just a personal anecdote on that. Sorry. But when I was in high school, there was um, a, I had a classmate named Jen who one year came back and identified as Jay and as a guy and just started using the boys bathroom in the boys locker room. 
And to be honest, when I was in high school, I didn't even know the word transgender. It didn't have the same visibility. Everyone kind of thought it was odd, but shrugged. Um, but now I'm imagining what would have happened if the school had sent out an announcement to all okay. the parents uh -huh. saying that this student will be now be doing this. On one hand, I think parents probably do have a right to know that information. But it, on the other hand, it, what was a nothing burger? And I will, however, acknowledge that a girl who transitions to identify as a boy, it poses less of a problem because, for example, a female it doesn't pose a threat to me physically in any way, in a, the way that there is uh, by coming into my locker room with the boys, in the way that the inverse, not trans people in particular, but biological males assigned natal males at birth have a physical advantage over women that is often intimidating and contributes to gender violence. Um, that exists, that dynamic in the transgender mm -hmm. identifying girl situation, but it doesn't yeah. exist in the trans boy situation. So maybe that's why that wasn't such a big deal. But at the same time, it a nothing. It was really a nothing burger in this kind of rural. I mean, it was Massachusetts, but it was pretty rural area, and there were uh, people. I mean, yeah, it was not a super super lib school. So I just, it's an interesting one, uh, but that wasn't the main reason people yeah. were voting against this bill. That was the aside, but I thought it was an interesting point. The four other Republicans who broke from the party to oppose the measure actually raised concerns about the federal government involving itself with local school districts. And these are the points that kind of hit home to me. Uh, the measure has a fatal flaw, said Buck of the legislation in an op-ed for the Washington Times. He noted that it had many worthwhile initiatives for parents to pursue, but he said while seemingly reinforcing parental rights, it undermines the critical principle for conservatives, which is federalism, the bedrock of our liberty. The Constitution provides a limited list of federal powers. As conservatives have rightly pointed out for decades, education is not on that list. My fellow Republicans in the House, confusing themselves with a national school board, believe the federal government should step in to protect parents. He said his GOP colleagues have succumbed to the latest populist fever, adding that House Republicans are willingly jettisoning the Constitution and federalism for a bill that elevates the federal government in education. He's from Colorado. He's a Republican. He also cautioned that giving the federal government a say in education now opens up the possibility of Democrats in the future using these new federal powers over education to advance a woke agenda. I love this quote. He said, contrary to what many of my Republican colleagues would have had us believe, federalism is worth protecting even when we control one chamber of Congress and even when we have ideas that would perform well on Instagram. Mike drop. He said the overwhelming majority of the House Republicans will be on record supporting the idea of expanded federal powers in your child's education. I have no doubt the Democrats will remind them of this position when they are back in charge and want to pass federal education bills. So that was a pretty strong op-ed. I thought he made amazing points. And he was joined by the others. Um, Biggs said that the vote said the nub of it is there's no constitutional authority for the federal government to regulate state and local education issues from the left or the right. And he said he agreed with Buck's op-ed. Uh, he's from Arizona, and he said that it's his opinion we should not have a federal Department of Education. And he went, uh, Rosendale, another one of the ones that voted against it, said on Twitter that the answer to an out-of-control education system is not turning more control over to the federal government. Uh, and Gates said, from wokeness to funding to bathrooms to critical race theory, the federal government should not be involved in education. Uh, he said, I don't want to strengthen the federal Department of Education. I want to abolish it. I don't want Congress more involved in decisions that are best made in local school districts. I want the Congress less involved. Therefore, I voted against today's Republican bill to establish a federal parental bill of rights. So they came out swinging on this. And I thought they made great points. And especially, I mean, Matt Gates is not somebody I align with very often. He's super MAGA. But I'll give him this. He is consistent in his principles from that viewpoint. And even though he probably is one of the people most outspoken against things like critical race theory, he recognizes that federalism supersedes that and that you cannot basically trade out your principles to get short term wins. Um, and that is, I think, if I had to say the biggest problem with Republicans, the biggest problem I have with conservative ideology is that they have increasingly been willing to do that in recent decades, where they will completely turn back on free markets, on limited government, on individual liberty to get short term wins against their opponents. And in doing that, not only do they sell out their principles, but they actually end up increasing the size of the federal government far faster than the left ever could because they set precedent that the left can then use when they're back in power to inevitably use what they did beforehand to continue bludgeoning a bigger hole in the wall. And so I completely stand by what these guys said. I think they're right, having thought through it more deeply. And I just love to see that there are at least still some people in Congress who think like this, who don't think 
how do I stir up my base on Instagram? How do I get a TV click? How do I raise the most money? How do I make the RNC happy and give me the best committee seat? And said, think, what do my principles say and how should I vote on this? Yeah, I definitely get what you're saying. I think these guys make a pretty strong critique of the legislation and rooted in principle. Um, it is, I, I guess I would, what I would say is I would like a bill um, with the same exact tenants to be introduced in all 50 state legislatures and passed because that is where the proper role uh, to regulate education is. There is no federal, it's simply in the constitution. It specifies the federal government's powers regulating a local school districts is not among them. That said, I can kind of see why, look, the federal government already does extensively regulate education, extensively fund education. We have a massive bloated federal education department. I can't understand the perspective of Republicans who would say the ship has sailed. And if it is going to be in the business of regulating um, education, we might as well have it do some good regulations too while it's at it. So I'm not as hardcore as you in siding with them. I definitely see their point but I can kind of see the pragmatic argument for the other side. But see, I disagree that it's pragmatic because I think if you always say, well, we shouldn't be doing this thing, but we're already doing it, so might as well do it a little bit better, that continues to move you down the road further and further away from ever being able to actually get the federal government out of these issues. And I think it has to start somewhere. Like the buck has to stop somewhere. And what would happen is if they pass this bill and they get the federal government now has this precedent of telling schools who are supposed to be governed locally and at, at most by the state, but mostly locally, mostly by school boards and mostly by city councils and then the state legislatures. If you start the precedent of the federal government coming in and telling them how to run operations, especially in this very rank and file mundane sort of capacity, then when the Democrats take back control, and they will because Republicans continuously have smaller and smaller ranks in this country, then they will use that precedent to come in and deconstruct everything you passed that you liked. But, but doesn't that precedent already exist, want. though? Like we already have federal regulations that tell I mean, local di school districts all sorts of things they can and can't do. To some extent. Well, we have the Department of Education that does, but Congress doesn't typically tend to pass bills like this. It's usually more through regulation. And that's a problem, right? Like Congress should be using their power to come in and strip the Department of Education of those powers. But instead, if Congress goes the other direction, and says, OK, we're already doing this under this department, so we're going to go ahead and start passing these other laws. I just think it's one thing that continues to give Democrats more and more power. And ultimately, it's why conservatives keep losing because they don't play chess. You know, they play checkers. <laughs> they're like, how do I take out this one token right here? And they're not thinking about the long game. And I really do think that is why they consistently lose the culture. They consistently lose. And when it comes to setting the laws that govern us and really the only way they've been smart strategically in my lifetime has been in their strategy around the court system. They've been very strategic in that, and that is paying off dividends. But when it comes to how they govern and a lot of the laws they pass and how they use their legislative power, they aren't usually as crafty or, or forward thinking. So I, I think this was exactly the right notion. And again, I just love to see people and really it's usually people like Justin Amash or Rand Paul or Thomas Massey that we see being willing to sort of go against their own side and push back from a principled standpoint. Um, so it was cool to see these guys do it because they're not usually in that camp. Yeah, well, I'll just say this. It is a bit odd that a, a quite a number of Republicans voted yes on this legislation to federally regulate education, but have also voted or sponsored or written laws that they've introduced to abolish the Department <laughs> of Education. And it would kind of seem that one has to go with the other. But hey, We'll, uh, we'll see how it all pans out. The legislation's not actually going anywhere anytime soon. So we'll leave it there. Let us know in the comments what you think of the Federal Parents' Bill of Rights. And with that, we've got to move on to our quick hits segment. Up first, we're going to react to something Ben Shapiro recently said uh, about criminal procedure and civil liberties when the question came up about the right to counsel. Because right now you have a right to a lawyer if you're being prosecuted for a crime. And if you can't afford one, the government, a.k.a. taxpayers, will pay for you to have one. A Shapiro on his show recently questioned whether there should really be a right to that. Take a listen to what he had to say. As far as Gideon versus Wainwright, the idea that if you're an indigent criminal defendant, you have to provide a counsel at trial. No, that is there's nothing in the Constitution that says specifically that you have a federal right to counsel. You have a right to defend yourself. Then the notion that the public has to pay for the counsel is obviously not Correct. I mean, I, I don't know if that had been true, then it wouldn't have taken until Gideon versus Wainwright to say so. Gideon versus Wainwright was like 1963 case. 
Um, so for 200 years, that wasn't the case. So what he's saying is that you have a right to defend yourself, but you don't have a right to a taxpayer funded defense attorney. What do you make of that, Hannah? Um, I think it's amazing that this guy is considered a good debater because that is one of the most asinine things I've ever heard. The Sixth Amendment literally says you have a right to an attorney. And when we say you have a right in the Bill of Rights and in the Constitution, that means that you have a right no matter what, not if you can afford it, not if you can raise the money to get it. You have a right to an attorney. And that's exactly as it should be, because if you are an individual who is having to go up against the government and all of its power and all of its money, you have virtually no ability to defend yourself unless you have money to hire an attorney or unless one is provided for you. And so if we are ever going to have any kind of system of justice where we can actually ensure that it's being allocated in a way where people are not wrongfully convicted, which we still miss the mark on drastically, uh, we have to ensure that people at the very least have representation and have the ability to try to defend themselves against the government and that the government has to make its case against an attorney proving beyond the shadow of a doubt that somebody did something. Now, he's right that the federal courts did not uphold that right until Gideon Rainwright. That's an atrocity. But to say that the courts didn't do it for 200 years, so it's not in the Constitution is bogus. We had well, tons of Because on that law. point, Hannah, the, that, that's like the Second Amendment has always said there's an individual right to bear arms. And of course, Ben Shapiro would agree with us on this. But that wasn't recognized until the 2000s in D.C. versus Heller. So it, would he say, therefore, that it wasn't a right before? Well, no, it was. It just wasn't being fully respected by our legal system. I just want to read you guys the Sixth Amendment, uh, which says, in all, it's pretty short. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law. All of that's kind of confusing, but dot, dot, dot. The accused shall enjoy the right to dot, dot, dot. Have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor to be confronted with the witnesses against him and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. So it says you have a right to counsel, which in this case, I think has to mean a right to taxpayers funding it because they're funding the lawyers prosecuting you and you're entitled to due process of law. So how could anyone have the right, have their right to a fair trial met? if they don't have a lawyer because they're indigent, they're broke. I mean, of all the things I'm willing to pay tax dollars for that I, or, or of all the things I'm unwilling to, but I'm forced to, that shouldn't be funded. The idea that criminal defense attorneys, which are uh, public defenders, which are in many cases extremely underfunded and overworked, and they aren't able to provide adequate representation. That is not the part that bothers me. I'm okay with my money being used to, to, ensure that the rights of the accused are up, upheld. And I think that conservatives support due process and all the and all these kinds of things when it comes to Me Too, and they should see the value in having a process that respects everyone's rights and funds adequate defense for them. I was surprised by this take. I guess it probably is the old school um, kind of conservative legal philosophy take on the matter, but it seems to me to be very out of step with what the Constitution actually says and the principles of due process that we would want to uphold. Well, you I mean, you'd be a fool to not hold that stance, Brad. And I think at the end of the day, if you if you have it, you have to be so unaware of how the criminal justice system operates. And you basically have to be a cent for big government because you're saying that you think the government's always going to get it right and act ethically and that people should basically be able to defend themselves if they're innocent. But we wrongfully convict people who are innocent all the time. We spend a vast amount of money in prosecutors' offices, we give the state tons of resources. They have all kinds of power. The police work for them. The labs work for them. An individual is supposed to be able to go up against all of that and not even have an attorney when they can't afford it, which, by the way, hardly anybody can afford it because the government can take their sweet time. Their lawyers are on salary. They have no rush. If you're hiring an attorney, you have to pay by the hour. So to be able to even afford to have an offense to go up against these people is insane. And we have wrongfully sentenced people for decades in this country. Something like 73% of North Carolina's death row was sentenced before they had an indigent defense fund. We kill people who are innocent because they can't afford good attorneys. In fact, one of the top reasons people get the death penalty is not because they are necessarily even guilty. It's because they can't afford an attorney. That's one of the top determinants. Um, so even though we do now we do now provide indigent defense funds, they're still very underfunded. I think criminal defense attorneys are some of the most important important roles in our entire political sector. They don't get the respect they deserve. They certainly they get don't vilified get sometimes, um, yeah. which I think is really unfortunate. They get tarred they with the crimes of their get, clients. 
they don't get the same resources. I mean, I have studies showing some defense attorneys ha- holding thousands of cases at one time. They are overworked, they are underpaid, and they are up against Goliath in the system. And I just think, as a whole, you know, Ben's being very disingenuous here. I, I agree with you; he would never hold that stance on the Second Amendment. And I think uh, if you really want to see people have due process and make sure that we get it right, you have to make sure people have an attorney. And again, it is in very plain language in the Sixth Amendment. So I encourage him to pick up the Bill of Rights and read it again uh, and recognize that just because the Supreme Court does not always uphold all of our rights, just like they've been destroying the Fourth Amendment for decades now, does not mean that the right's not there or should not be upheld. So up next, we're going to talk about sports, sports balling. Yay. Uh, so. Charles Barkley, who I'm not, I will admit, I'm not super familiar, but I know that he, I I don't know what that is. What? Oh my gosh. Brad, Space Jam, the like classic 90s with Michael Jordan and the Looney Tunes where they defeat the evil space aliens. Charles Barkley. No, I never heard of it. All right. Well, it's a, he was a basketball player. um, Yeah. It's about basketball. What recently has come up is uh, Charlie Baker, my former governor, my former governor in Massachusetts, is the new president of the NCAA college athletics, obviously. And he recently said that he wants consumer protections around name, image and likeness, which is a big debate within college sports about how much rights should an athlete have to their own image and likeness and the monetization of it. And uh, so Charlie Baker says he wants federal legislation uh, regulating this. And um, Charles Barkley had a a pretty based response, Hannah. Take a listen to this. Chuck, you're shaking your head. <laughs> Did he say we're going to ask the politicians to help us? See, that, that pisses me off already. Our politicians are awful people. As I talked to Clark earlier, because I asked him about y'all conversation, I would actually go to people who actually care about basketball, not looking at it just from himself. I would put a committee together. I would love for Clark to be on the committee, get some coaches, get some players. And let's try to work this thing out. We can't ask these politicians nothing. Those people are awful people. Democrats and Republicans, they're all crooks. So I will admit, I cracked up a little when he just said, they're awful people. <laughs> they're all crooks. Charles Barkley, the libertarian. I knew I liked him as a kid. I always thought he was the cutest in Space Jam, so I had a little crush on him as a child. But now it's backed up even further. This was hella based. I thought he came out swinging. I love that he was like, all of them, Democrats and Republicans, why would you let these people regulate it? They're not for you. They don't work for you. They don't have your interests at heart. Like, he came out hard. And I think there's just something so pleasant about watching, like, non-political people just come in and knock it out of the park like this because they get it, right? Instinctively, I think people who are actually awake and paying attention recognize that there is one party and they don't work for you and that you don't want these people governing your basic decisions or your finances and you don't have to be like super politically astute to have common sense and recognize that. No, I agree with you. And I also think there's a broader philosophical point here that he kind of stumbles on, which is what Hayek called the knowledge problem, right? Federal regulators huddled in an office in Washington, D.C. simply don't have the diverse knowledge of things across the country that they're trying to regulate. So, for example, something like college sports name, image, and likeness, these people don't know anything about. Members of Congress don't know any, maybe a few of them are super sports fans and do, but like the actual college association officials and the student and the student athletes and the organizations that represent them, they know about this, right? And they should be, if you don't regulate it and you'll leave it up to them to sort out among themselves, the people closest to the situation will be the ones writing the rules. That's going to be much more functional than if people who aren't familiar with the situation from far away who are responsible for hundreds of different subjects are trying to write rules for something that they aren't particularly familiar with and don't understand. A great example of this is tech regulation. Congress is full of people who literally don't understand how Wi-Fi works, which (laughs) is what we saw at the TikTok hearing last week. Uh, A representative did not understand why TikTok would need to connect to his house's Wi-Fi network. And yet these people are going to write comprehensive sweeping regulations on data privacy in the tech sector. Tell me how that's going to work out. Like this is the, the, the theory behind decentralization that Hayek explained is that the people closest to a situation are the most familiar with it and should be the ones who govern themselves. Uh, and, and so in most cases, So for something like college sports to need to be regulated in Washington, D.C. like this 
doesn't make much sense and is probably going to lead to a dysfunctional result for the exact reasons that Charlie, Charles Barkley just explained. I also think there's something so patronizing about what your former governor said at the top, which is that we need to have these regulations and these standard things for people to follow when they're making these deals because these poor, stupid kids can't determine. No, that's wrong. I mean, I really think that's something that is just really backwards at how we look at things. People are often their own best advocates. And just because somebody is better at being an advocate for themselves than others doesn't mean you need to regulate it. Because what you do is you sort of, you know, bring the bottom down. If I'm a really good negotiator and I'm a college athlete, I should be able to make my own deals and figure out what's best for me and even hire assistants if that's what I want to do to determine the legality of some of those things. But I think you could have sort of a standard contract that you gave these athletes from the association to say, here's the best practices or here's an educational workshop so that you don't get taken advantage of. But to say that they want to come in and regulate what kind of deals these people can sign. I mean, as a whole, it just seems to be that this is always where things tend to go. They just made it legal for them to li license their own likenesses very recently. That was a very corrupt thing they banned forever. And now they're trying to find ways to come in and take back control of that. And I just think if I were a college athlete, I would be very annoyed at that. All right, guys, let us know what you think in the comments. We'll leave it there on that subject um, and move on to our mailbag. So oldie but goodie wrote, I thought I was going to hear some good political commentary. Guess I was wrong. We'll be crossing these two dweebs off my list of must listen to. All right. I mean, Man. OK. <laughs> yeah, this I mean, look, airport. you don't have to announce that you're leaving. <laughs> I mean, not everyone. We're not going to be everybody's cup of tea. And, and that's OK. All right. Well, Patrick D said, I am a nearly 70 year old white male and I sincerely appreciate the way you both discuss and debate things in a polite and constructive manner. I feel better informed on important issues. Thank you and keep it coming. Thanks, Patrick. Glad to have you. Yeah. Uh, Chris wrote 51 year old first time listener. You two are intelligent, eloquent, witty and pretty. Ooh, keep it up. Listening, listening forward to more. We love people who tell us we're pretty. Uh, Rolling yeah. Treat said, well explained, framed, and analyzed across the board. BP and HC make a good tag team for better research than typical and better nuance analysis in general. Uh, Rabin's Carrot said, my guy looks like a mix between an Oblivion NPC and Ben Shapiro. What does that mean? Let's look up a picture of Oblivion I don't know. NPC. People do compare you to Ben Shapiro a good bit, though. I've noticed that. Like, oh, my gosh. This is what an Oblivion NPC looks like, Hannah. I'm going to drop it in our text chat with our producers. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I, this is what he's saying I look like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a gnome looking dude with a unibrow and yellow hair and long, okay. pointy, elfy ears. So You know what I get told I look like in my comments all the time? What? In a younger version of Ricky Lake. And I didn't know who Ricky Carrie Lake was. Carrie Lake? No, Ricky Lake. I had to look her oh. up. She's apparently was a talk show host in like the 90s and 2000s. And they're always like, she looks like a younger version of Ricky Lake. And I was like, who's Ricky Lake? Actually, so I, I just Googled to... her and I do kind of see it. But it's also not an insult. She looks like she no, was a beautiful cute. woman. Uh, our producer just says, you actually look like Alanis Morissette. Thank you. I love her. She's That's bad. a compliment. That is a compliment. Um, uh, all right. I think we have one more. All right. Sportscraft says, here's the Democrats position on school choice in a nutshell. School choice for themselves and their children, zero choice for the plebes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's the it. position of that's the position of democratic politicians, but everyday Democrats actually support school choice according to polls. Uh that's true. so uh Hannah, what's your hot take? All right. I've actually started keeping a list of hot takes in my phone because I feel like I have good ones throughout the week and I can't think of them on the spot. So mine are gonna be fire moving forward. I've got a full arsenal. Um today I think that bumper stickers are heinous. I cannot think what compels people to take something and put it on their car and ruin their pretty car. There's nothing I feel strongly enough about to put it on a bumper sticker on my car. I hate them. And I just, yeah, I don't get it at all. Very opposed to bumper stickers. All right. So I guess our merch line won't be including any bumper <laughs> stickers. But um, I actually, one of the first things my boyfriend did where he slowly, he changed me on the surface level. He loved who I was as a person, but there were superficial things about my life that he thought could be improved upon. So <laughs> that's why he started slowly um, doing the laundry and then certain items of clothing just disappeared <laughs> and, and were never seen again. Here. <laughs> and new ones were um, uh, purchased and arrived. And another thing that he did was I, I when we met, I had two bumper stickers on my car. One said had three check boxes and it said Republican and the box wasn't checked. 
Democrat and the box wasn't checked. And then the third one said awake and the box was checked. And the other one was the coexist bumper sticker. But instead of coexist, it said capitalist in the exact <laughs> same um, like font and style. So it was like a parody of the cringe coexist one. And it said capitalist and the symbol, it was made out of like guns and the Eiffel Tower and a dollar sign. Um, So I thought they were cool, but he said they were cringe. They're okay, but they're better for your Facebook page as a meme, you know? Yeah, I guess. Okay. My hot take is that people need to stop post, especially like trad conservatives, need to stop posting these memes that are like, nostalgic 1950s life magazine adverts and waxing about the good old days when Americans could own a house on one income and could travel twice a year with the family. And meanwhile, if you actually look, first off, these are fake pictures. They're from fictional advertisements from the 1950s. In reality, home sh- homeownership rates are up. Disposable incomes are way up. People are better off financially than they were then uh, in most ways. And meanwhile, she was popping pills, right? Like they would prescribe these housewives would. This is where the whole meme of like the plumber cheated, the adultering with the plumber came about. She was cheating on the husband. She was (laughs) popping tranquilizers that the doctor handed her to cope with her depression. He was physically abusive. The kids were getting bullied and uh, deeply unhappy. And like, meanwhile, the this is the white family and the black family down the street was being segregated. Like the 1950s are not a time to be nostalgic for in most ways. And when you, when you wax poetic and have this weird nostalgia for them, I mean, I'm not saying that it means you're a bad person, but you're clearly missing something or thinking about a very specific perspective on what that time was like. So I always find there's this a lot of this in trad circles, this nostalgia for the past and this deep, deep pessimism about the present. And I can be pretty pessimistic about the present sometimes, but there's so much that people take for granted. Trad people are the real emos these days. No, let's be serious. If the 1950s were so great, boomers wouldn't have turned out like they did. OK, like it wasn't going great. Things were going really awry. Uh, but they have this like they have this nostalgia for the marketing of the 1950s, which I think is highly hilarious. Like, guys, not the you, reality, not the reality. That's like looking back at like 1990s advertising. Like, oh, it was so great because of this. Like, no, you didn't live through it. You don't actually know what you're talking about. You're falling for like the advertising of the 1950s. And it's weird. Yeah, They're always sharing literal adverts from magazines yeah. and stuff. It's not real. It's not a depiction of reality. That's like saying like today's Budweiser commercials depict how what life was like in 2023. No, they yeah. don't. Like, It makes no sense. But I will say one thing that is accurate is I found this diet from like the 1950s or 1960s that ran in a magazine that women were legitimately doing. And it involved a glass of white wine at each meal and like some hard boiled eggs. It was a bizarre diet, but apparently you got to drink a lot more when you're on a diet in the 1950s, which sounds better than what I have to do. Like no carbs, no fun. Anyways, that's a wrap, guys. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Be sure to leave us a comment, leave us a review. We can read it on the show. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And until next week, stay based. Stay based.